what you do. Why do you come out here with a little zero weapon? You could have stayed at the house and turned on your TV. You could have watched TV next to her. But somebody here know that the TV can't reach out and shake hands with you.
had heard me, rabbits had heard me, deer had heard me. But my coming out song was, I'm probably going to record that little song too. This will be what I've got one day. I know it's going to set me free. So thank you men for singing. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of last week. 
Oh, they would remember this from a play, son. I see three, four, five hands. How many remember this term of the last son? You remember? Yes, sir. All right, what was the name of it? Things We Must Forget About. You can have a look at it, okay? You can have a look at it. All right. Six things that every successful leader must forget. Yes. I start to say call them out, but I won't put you on that. I can call them out. I can call them out. What we want to do is we, we want to uh, make copies of that sermon available to especially to the, uh, the leaders because we want you to keep this in mind as you go through the year 2007. So for those who would like a copy of that manuscript, I mean everything I said, including the mm. <laughs> Got it wrote up. Everything that I said would be there if you like a manuscript copy. Then uh, the one that's here should kind of give you a little we can kind of know how many we need. Those who would like one, just raise your hand and kind of give us an idea how many would like a manuscript copy of last Sunday. All right, especially our leaders. The one that kind of, we had about that many this morning too, so we're looking to make 200 copies. Of, yeah, we have a little for the next week. If you're going to read them, keep them all on your own. Yes, sir. You know, you're tearing up little trees and, and you're taking them throw it away. Amen. All right. Um, I'm going to read the text. Greg, I just want to do a little piece of my song. It's an A flat. That's why I just saw it in C. That's why I used to sing back in the day when I could, when I could sing. When I was really doing part of the same thing. Now this is a whole body. I've gotten old. Older. <laughs> so the chief thank you for your card that said God is with you even when your hair starts turning gray when you get old. Yeah, Lord. Always. Luke chapter 4. Now, while you're turning down, I just want to say, please see Deacon, uh, not Deacon, but Deacon, be alone. Uh, everybody who wants to be a part of the Super Bowl party next Sunday, we're going about 5 o'clock, and it's food and surround sound down there. All of my co players in the house. We're <laughs> afraid to say you're a co player. <laughs> Wear it next Sunday. Tony. 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 We have a wonderful <laughs> fellowship. It would be a time for us to fellowship together. And that's a time to get to know each other even better. Go to the Super Bowl fellowship next Sunday morning. Same one next Sunday evening at 5. Game to kick off at 5 at 2. Food start at 4. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're wrong. You're good. We're gonna be, it's going to be catered, blessed by God. We're going to be fixing us. I know we're going to have some wine. I said wine. I want the chicken and wine. <laughs> Amen. But please give a big and long and let him know. Even if you don't have the $10 to give, give with him let him know you're coming so we'll know how much food you prepare. The fellowship been going on the last four years. Please. Let's keep it going. Keep it going. Amen. Verse 14, starting at verse 14 in um, chapter 4. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out the fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogue, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been. It had been, custom, been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, 
and the covering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fasting on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. But somebody had to say, is not this Joseph's son? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe see. And we'll pick it up right there next Sunday. Is not this Joseph's son? But today we will concentrate on his sermon. And within the sermon that and you didn't know he was preaching. And we can use this particular sermon to talk about what Jesus wants to do for you. What Jesus wants to do for you. For those who are looking for the subject, that's it. What does he want to do for you? Amen. Now just Amen. to get my tone back here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see if we come to eight flesh. This is my praise song. I don't care if you don't say anything. I wrote this song. And I was really going through something. I'm going to transition. Moving from uh, one church to another one. And I wasn't ready to leave that church. And God said it was time to move on. And I, with tears in my eyes, and this is on the first record that we did, Lord, let me write this little song. You find me flat. I just want to please the Lord. Be in His way in every way. Lost in his presence, found in his likeness. I want to hear him say, Well done, someday. I want to hear him 
exactly what you just heard and read in your hearing. Yeah, no, yes, sir. Now, say we'll look at the response next week. You want to come back. You don't want to miss part number two. Amen. But uh, how everyone reacted. It was one thing for them to hear. I said, they, they did hear. Listen to them. But I didn't know, I don't care how much preaching is going to go on here today, somebody going to go out acting just a little yes, bit different. That's right. Yeah. I love it. Good and you hear the crowd with that? Not that Joseph boy. <laughs> so right now, I won't go there. I won't, I won't go there. I just want to focus upon the word that Jesus spoke at the beginning of his message. And it's a very important passage of scripture because it tells us what Jesus came to do. All right. It tells us what Jesus is all about. Yes, sir. It tells us what were his priorities. It tells us what was his goal? I know. Every ministry got to have some priorities and got to have some goals in mind. Yeah. And as we look at the priorities of Jesus and the goals of Jesus, I'm hoping that something is clicking in some minister's mind right here. God did not call us just to do nothing. But he set an example for us. And Jesus said, now, this is what I came to do. And he said, he said to us, follow me. But now, this is what I came to do. This is what I came to do. These are my priorities. He said, first thing I want you to know that I came to do, I came to meet your deepest need. Well. I came to meet your deepest need. He began the sermon by saying, the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to whom? To the poor. All right, I want to see who's awakening here. <laughs> that just added five minutes to the sermon. You all want to call response. Call response. Call response. If I say something that's right, say amen. Amen. If I say he, 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 he was sent to preach the gospel to whom? The Lord. All response, okay? All right. All response. And let me know you're still alive. You're still with me. That's all right. Yeah, he, he, was, he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He was talking about, yes, he was talking about material poverty. He was talking about material things to be sure, but now that's not all he was talking about. Yes, he was talking about material poverty, but he was also talking about spiritual poverty as well. Yeah. Amen. But can I tell you the reason why he was talking material? Because in the first century, poverty was widespread. And it was very, very brutal. People could work hard all their life, six days a week, back-breaking labor from dawn to nightfall. And after all that work, they would still have nothing to show for it. Yeah. Somebody said, that sounds just like me today. <laughs> Not well, just the first century, but that's true in the 21st century. Yeah. But at least I can tell you, that may be true for somebody, but I can tell you that if you're willing to work hard and apply yourself, you do have a chance to make it in today's society. All right. But if you're not willing to apply yourself, you're not willing to work hard, you're just waiting on a handout. These people could work hard all day and still had nothing to show for it. And for those who couldn't find work or those who was, wasn't physically able to work, there was no system in place to look out for. No welfare, no social security, none of that was in place. They had one option. If they were poor, no social security, no welfare, they had one option. That was the beg. We had a society of people begging. The governmental structure and the system of the taxation was designed to keep the working class poor and the helpless destitute. The poor, they were society's outcasts. Amen. Religious folks looked down upon the poor. That was in the first century. I don't know if that's true in the 21st century. Religious people, those elite people, they looked down on those who were poor. They had the attitude that if they are poor, then they must deserve to be poor. Leave us alone. You deserve to be where you are. We can give them that little circle, you know. But Jesus came to preach a message that could be found in the Old Testament, but it was a message that had been overlooked. Amen. It was often overlooked because his message was that the so-called unimportant people of society, 
His message was to those who were weak. His message was to those who were poor. His message was to those who were helpless. And his message to them was, you matter to God. I don't care what society think about you. Jesus said, you do matter to God. God still loves you. I don't care about what you have. He wanted the poor people of Galilee, especially the poorest of the poor, to know that it may seem like that organized religion have no place for you. Help me preach somebody. But to God, you are precious. Organized religion may push you aside and may call you nothing and nobody, but to God, you are precious. He cares about you. Somebody here that has been looked down on and put down on, I want you to know God cares about you, and not only does he care about you, but he'll take care of you. You may not be able to drive what other people drive or live what some folks live, or even wear what some folks wear, but God still loves you. And Jesus came to proclaim that good news to the poor. But not just to the material poor. But he was referring to those of us whose lives are empty and poor in a number of ways. All of us fit somewhere in there. You might say, well, I got good material things. He wasn't talking about me. I'm not poor. I got money. You got money in the bank. No, you don't. <laughs> I need to ask that song, I got money in the back of the heat line. <laughs> you know, all of us fit somewhere in there because all of us, we are destitute in a number of ways. During the course of my ministry, I have served in the communities. Some communities where people were very affluent. Mm -hmm. They had stuff. Mm -hmm. And they talked a little different. Mm -hmm. They had the things of life. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, come and see my come on, come yacht. I'm passing in places like that. Come and see my mansion. Uh -huh. I drive my 62 Cadillac convertible. <laughs> original. <laughs> Fine, I've been there. I pastored in those communities. And also pastored in some desperately poor communities. But people were so poor until they didn't know they were poor. Amen. Still had stuff on the outside. You got better use it outside to go. I've lost a lot of people right now. I know that. None of this inside plumbing. <laughs> that, that's the nice back to <laughs> But I learned something in these various communities. And here's what I learned. I learned that whether I was in the poor community mm -hmm. or whether I was in the affluent community, there is lack everywhere. Amen. 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 Even among the affluent, there is lack everywhere. Yeah. There's a tremendous lack in the lives of those who have all kinds of material things. There's still a lack. Amen. There's not a single person that I know that doesn't struggle. Notice I said that I know that doesn't struggle with some kind of lack in their life. Yeah. It may not be material, right, man. but there's still a lack. Some people got it. You got it like that. You got it like that. You got it like that. But on the other hand, when you really think about your life, and I said, already said you lack something somewhere. And I just ask the question: Where are you poor this morning? Where are you poor? Where are you poor? What, when somebody said, well, "What are you talking about?" Well, some people you could be still poor in your finances. Right. You could have money. You can make. Fifteen hundred dollars a week or whatever. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> but you can still, by the time you get through paying your bills, <laughs> and sometimes you may not be able to make ends meet. I don't care how much money you make, you still can't make ends meet. 
and you will still what? Financially poor. I don't care how much money you make, but if you don't have any management skills, and some people don't have, don't know how to manage the money. Just because you make a lot, and you think you're supposed to go spend a lot. And you're still broke. And I'm making all this money, and I'm still broke. You lack even still. Some people are lacking in their relationships. You got a lot of stuff at the house. But how do they know that don't make a relationship? Oh, you can buy all the rings and coats you want. Buy all the shoes you want. Buy all the grace that you want. But there's no substitute for real love. There's no substitute for sitting close to me and putting your arms around me. I don't care about all the stuff you buy, but do you love it? So there's a lot of suffering in relationships with people who you think by looking at what they wear and what they drive and where they live, you think they are happy. But there's a lot of lack going on. I talked to preachers last week, Brother Gold, Brother Max, they know. I talked to preacher after preacher who got big churches. Yeah, I love it. Oh, a lot of members, big, beautiful buildings. But I had to stand by and hear several of them cry. The people think I got it made. My Lord, I hear you, doctor. Because they see the size of my building. They see what I drive, they see what I wear, they see how many people I got. They think I got it made, but man, I'm hurting. I know. There's some lack. Yeah. Even in my own relationships. Yeah. There's some people in your life right now that's supposed to be bringing you happiness. Yeah. They're supposed to be. You ought to be, I mean, when they show up in the evening, they drive up in the driveway, you ought to be so happy you just turn around three times. <laughs> Tell you right now, but that's the only thing about Reverend Banks, boy. He was he, he was all ready to come home. He was like what was going on, but he was ready to get back to his wife. <laughs> Phone calls and text messages and all kinds of stuff. He was ready to go. That's why we want to come back a little bit early. But I want you to know, I was ready to go too. <laughs> yes, sir. And I wanted to get home to my honey buddy. <laughs> And didn't leave either. When I got home, I stayed there until I got ready to leave. I hear you, God. I hear because you. Because what you bring that fulfillment into my life. Amen. But sad to say, there's a number of people that's not happening in your relationship. There's some lack there. You're, you're still empty. <laughs> and for some, there's there 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 there's some emotional poverty going on right there. You got a lot of stuff, but you're emotionally unstable. <laughs> I don't know which one of you gonna show up. And you know, if I don't know the person that you deal with, they don't know which one gonna show up either. You may come out of a bag anytime. Any time. <laughs> Think everything's all right. You just all of a sudden come out of a bag. Emotionally unstable. That's emotional poverty. Some people have no sense of joy. Some people don't believe you're supposed to have fun. Right. They're supposed to be dull and dead and have that Christian face on whatever that looks like. I don't know what it's Christian face. Well, well, well. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> You, you tore up from the floor. <laughs> no joy, no direction, no fulfillment, no purpose. To me, that, that, that there's a lack in your life. I don't care what you have, I don't care where you work or what you drive, there's a lack. Jesus came and said, that's the reason why I came, I came to fill that up. I came to preach to the poor of the poor. Whether it be material or spiritual, he said, that's why I'm here. I can give you the joy you've been searching for. No matter what your needs are in life, Jesus said, if you're going through a season of lack, 
And how many know if you haven't been through your season, you get ready to go through your season while you're coming out of your season? If you're going through a season of lack, I want you to know that Jesus said, I'm with you. Whether it be financial or any other season of lack, he said, Lo, I'll be with you always. Oh, so God understand that Jesus will help you through your period of lack. Now somebody always say amen right there. That's a good place to shout. If Jesus had ever helped you in your life, you know you was down in the point, and there was poverty in your relationship, or even there was poverty in your finances, but you know Jesus came through some way, somehow. That's a good place to shout, right? Yeah. He did it, but Jesus will help you to overcome whatever power that exists in your life. He will help you to overcome it, and then he will give you the strength to endure that, and whatever's in the way, he know how to move it out of the way. Whatever it is that's putting that poverty in your life. Somebody hit me to get ready, get ready. If you listen to the message of Jesus, you ought to say, I'm coming out of this thing. He came to meet your deepest need. But next thing, he said, he said, I, I want to set you free from whatever it is that has a hold on you. Notice what Jesus said. He said, and I'm skipping over broken hearted for now. He said, God has sent me to proclaim release to the captain. Yeah. All right. To proclaim freedom to the prisoners. Yeah. Right now. Now, I'm not just talking about people who locked up in jail. <laughs> All right, buddy. All right. Come on, God. Get you off. Just like everybody struggled with some poverty issues. Yeah. I want to tell you that somebody's struggling right here today. Yeah. So stuff that got you locked up. Yeah. You in prison. Yeah. You've been taken captive by something. And uh, we, we can look around and see who, you know, whose hands are shackled, whose feet are shackled. But I'm telling you, you got shackles on. Well, come on now, come on. We don't have to look, just look within yourself, like you have to look at your own poverty issues, look at what it is that got, got you shackled up. You're in prison. Uh, and for some, you know, they just show up a little quicker than others. That's why that song we can easily call out. For some people, food has them captive. It don't take long for somebody to see when food has somebody in captivity. Well, well. I mean, you look at me and tell I was in cap I was captured by food. And, and I don't care what I had to do, I just I just had to eat it. Well, I, I would be full, but still just had to eat. That's easy to see. Some people uh, uh, are in captivity to sex. And I'm, I'm saying, go set. It's got you. That's all you think about. That's all you be about. It's got your mind all messed up. You get up in the morning with it on your mind. You walk through the day with it on your mind. You go to bed with it on your mind. On your mind all the time. It's got you captured. You go on the TV looking for it. You pick up the magazine looking for it. And then you begin to see it. You want to do it. You want to think it. Yeah, I said it. Alcohol got some people. You just drink. You just got it. Some people drink themselves sober. Get to the point where you don't know, know your name and you just keep drinking and you find out you've got a name again. E and J and the mother J. It's got you, got you, you can't. You can't. Gambling got some people. Yeah. 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 
So you can't go in the store. You got to buy four, five, six of them. You got a $50 they have it. You got to, I just got to buy them. Don't let it go up to $200 million. Oh, God. And you buy more, the higher you get, the more you buy. Yeah. Yeah. Some people are cas right. casino freaks. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I said, I said, I ain't scared.
he, and Shelby was talking about it last night, we were talking to the dad, just, he just kind of made light of it, like, oh, it's all right. It's all right. Nothing wrong with my heart. I feel good. I'm all right. Nothing wrong. Can't okay, what the doctor said. But he was going to go with for the father, get a second opinion. He was a specialist. And the doctor had told him on that Monday before Christmas, and he didn't make it. Something could have been done right then when the doctor said, look, you need to get this taken care of now. And he could have been around, but he was trying to go somewhere because he didn't believe anything was wrong. I need to tell somebody this. Kevin Farrell smoked for a number of years. And he said, man, the doctor told me, he said, although I had quit some 20 years ago, still there was some residual things. And so tell your people, Get themselves checked. You may have quit some years. I quit a few years ago. Somebody want to know how long ago it was. Yesterday. Pastor used to smoke. Yeah! I used to smoke five packs of cigarettes. It was the hardest thing to put them away. I was changed, yeah. I was I was changed. But God delivered me. Not that it was 20 years ago, not yesterday. No, it's been over, it's been over 20 years. Now I've got a witness right there. Won't God do it? Amen. But guess what? When Governor Farrell told me what that, guess what I'm going to do? First day, Monday morning. Well. Although I just got a checkup just a few months ago, I'm going to call the doctor, are you sure? <laughs> Check me out again! Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just had to drop that in there because yeah. I, I want somebody to <laughs> It's got you. Now these are the ones that people can spot easily. Right. But there are some other things that got us captive too. <laughs> Somebody's anger got you in captivity. You can't do good in a relationship you're in now because you're mad about the last one you were in. Can't no man or woman be good enough now because you're still angry about the one you just came out of. You have never known this shit. Everybody come along, the same stuff keep coming up. Anger got you in prison. Somebody's in prison by guilt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though you didn't have no business being there. But you went on anyway. And you did it. And that guilt is eating you up. And you wonder, why not keep going back and I'm knowing how I'm going to feel after it's over? <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> I don't care what you try to you try to hide, you just sit down and eat. Get up there. <laughs> Take a bath, get up there. Come to church, get up there. Yeah. It's got you. Well. In prison. Resentment, depression, jealousy, revenge factor. Get them back. You know, okay, how much you try to manage your rage? How much you try to manage your lust? Okay, how much you try to manage your bitterness? You can't do it. Because you're in prison. <laughs> you don't control it. It controls you. Every person in this room has been or is captive to something. And if there's somebody that is still held captive by something, I want you to know Jesus came to set you free. And I can tell you he can do it because I know he did for me. I, I, I want you to tell somebody else, Jesus came to set you free. John 8, 36 said, if the Son makes you free, then you are free indeed. If Jesus set you free, then you are free indeed. I don't have to go out no more because I'm free. Yeah. <coughs> Jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captive. Yeah. 
freedom to breathe. And that includes you. That includes you. I want you to think for yourself about how good it would be right now in your life to be set free. Imagine that. Now those who've been set free is a good place to shout. So for those who have been set free, imagine what it would be like right now to be set free. The guilt is gone. The past no longer haunts you. Your sins and mistakes no longer torment you. Your shame no longer engulfs you. Why? Because you've been set free. Hallelujah. You've been set free. Imagine, 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 imagine that your anger no longer controls you. If you're in a situation that does not go your way, and normally you would cut loose and cut somebody out. That's what I said. No, yes. you can cut them loose. Yes. But imagine that you're in a situation now that doesn't go your way, and instead of you cussing somebody out now, you can go to them in a spirit of peace. Yes. Yes. You don't explode in a fit of repentance, yes. but you respond peacefully with wisdom, with strength, with leadership. Yes. Yes. Imagine that. What has happened? Well, I've been set free. Yes. Imagine being set free. Free. You're no longer captive to inappropriate sexual thoughts. You no longer come to church checking somebody out. That's the truth. You may not agree, but that's just it. Some people that they come just to check out. You see a certain person, a certain thing, you act like I don't know what that means. Everybody know what that means. But imagine that now, you know, stuff that you to get, get your mind all crazy when you watch on TV or when you see certain magazines, it'll get you crazy and you will want to think about more of this than you want to see more. You know that's what happens. That's what happens. You want to think about it more. You want to see more, yeah. then you want to do more. Yeah. <laughs> and you know where it goes. But now, imagine the fact that, that it, it no longer gets to you anymore. You're able to say, that's not for me. That's not mine. That's not my wife. That's not my husband. That's not my friend. That belongs to somebody else. Imagine you being able to walk away from that and be able to say, in the name of Jesus, Against that, you're not gonna bother me anymore. Imagine that. What has happened? Well, you've been set free. Anybody been set free up in here? Anybody know you've been set free? Anybody know you've been delivered and have you found? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hear him close here. But I had to stay there for a minute. The next point won't be there long. I know somebody won't have the point he got. But he came to meet your deepest spiritual need. But he also came to set you free. But he also wanted to give you a new outlook on life. Jesus said, I came to proclaim recovery of sight to the blind. Not just the physical blind. He did heal some blind people. And he's still healing. But he was not speaking just literally. But he was also speaking bigger to them as well. Yeah, there's another type of blindness. The blindness to the truth. And it applies to all of us. There are times when our fear of our, our prejudice, our lack of faith, amen, and even our sins, prevent us from seeing God's truth in the situation. I remember once, a while back, I was talking to a close friend about a problem I was having. And I kept telling him how big the problem was. Oh, yeah. How insurmountable I thought the problem was. How ineffective I had been at fixing the problem. Yeah. And how remote was any hope of any solution for the problem. I, I was in all the bad stuff. Right. Well, yeah. Found my friend said, I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> he said, look man, 
you have said one thing of truth in this entire conversation. So what you're doing, you're looking at this all wrong. You are exaggerating the problem and underestimating God. Now I'm talking about, he's talking to the preacher. You exaggerate the problem and underestimate God. And I found out, you know, a lot of us do that. We exaggerate the problem and underestimate God. We underestimate God's ability to work through the problem, whatever this problem may be. All right, now. You need to see your situation, my friend said. See it from God's perspective. All right, now. You know what? He was right. <laughs> I asked God to help me to see the situation from a perspective other than my own frustration. Help me see through the eyes of faith. And as soon as I begin to realize that, looking through the eyes of God, the problem was not as big as I thought it was. I had more resources than I thought I had. Well, I thought I had limited resources. God took the limited things I had, and God took little and made much out of it. I didn't know God can do that. It may not look like you got enough to make it meet that, but God knows how to take what little you have when you give it to him. The same God that took two fishes, I know that the same God can take the little resources that you have and he can pay your bills. He can put clothes on your back, shoes on your feet, and food on your table when you think you don't have nothing. Every time you go to the refrigerator, there's food eat. You thought you couldn't pay your mortgage, but you look around, it's been paid. Stop exaggerating the problem, no, that's, no, that's made God. Right. So God came, Jesus said, I came to give me some new eyes. <laughs> a new outlook on life. And then, and I'm closing, he said, I came to make you feel good. I know somebody said, that's a little shallow there. Yeah. Feel good, yeah, that's what I said. Somebody made me surprised, but I, I, want you to, I want you to understand something. On the surface, it may seem shallow, but think about it. God doesn't want you to go through life feeling bad all the time. How many want to feel good up in here? I don't have anybody that want to go around just feeling bad, looking bad, acting bad all the time. I, I want to feel good. Feel good about life. And Jesus said that several times throughout the scripture. Amen. That he wants you to feel good. In today's text, he said, I came to set free those who are downtrodden, those who are broken hearted. I came to set at liberty those who are bruised. Don't care how bruised you are, Jesus said, I want you to feel good about yourself. Anybody ever been bruised up in here? Has life ever gotten the best of you? Sometimes life just beats you down. But Jesus care about your emotional bruises. He wants to help you to bear those bruises. He care about the hurts that you had to endure. But he's ready and able to lift you out. No matter how fragile you are. No matter how vulnerable you may feel. Jesus is ready to protect you right now. That's why he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And in other words, he said, I am gentle and humble in heart. Jesus said, I want you to understand if you've been bruised and beat, I'm here for you. If you've been downtrodden, if you've been crushed, Jesus wants to release you from your oppression. He wants to build you up emotionally. Do I have a witness here? In other words, he wants you to feel good. I said they want you to feel good. Now, I know somebody saying, well, I don't live by feelings. I live by faith, but still, he wants you to feel good. Somebody said feeling can be tricky, but that's all right. He still wants you to feel good. You don't have to go through life feeling bad all the time. You don't have to go through life feeling blue all the time. You don't have to go through life feeling bruised and beaten all the time. You can feel good. Oh, Lord. I need somebody to understand that James Brown was right when he said, I feel good. Like I knew that I should. Like I knew that I would not. He's 
said, so good, so good. He said, because I got you. And I can say the same thing. I feel good. Like I knew I would. So good. So good. Because I got Jesus. Jesus on my mind. Keep me singing all the time. You will have a witness. Jesus said, I want you to be full of joy. Yeah, I want you to experience abundance of life. I came that you can have life and have it more abundantly. Oh, Lord. I came that you can experience some peace in your life. Jesus wants you to have some peace right now. Joy and peace. Oh, Lord. Why? Because I've been blessed. Yes, I have. And I have to say something right here. I'm too blessed. To be oppressed, you will have a witness. When I think about the goodness of God and all that He's done for me, I'm too blessed to be oppressed. Oh Lord, well, did anybody here know what I'm talking about? No, they've been blessed. They have been blessed. If you want to be able to say, Praise God, praise God. some bad days. I've had some heels in my life. I've had some houses in my life. But when I think about what they done for me, oh, my good days, I wish my bad days. Oh, my good days. Oh, my good days. I wish my bad days. But it's all over. He said, I came to set liberty to them who are free. But verse 19 said, to preach the acceptable years of the Lord. In other words, I came to give you some favor. Somebody help me say favor. He wants you to experience the favor of God. It's time. It's time. The Lord's favor has come in your life. I know you've been going through it. Heartaches, heartaches, good God Almighty. But God's favor has come. Somebody help me say favor. Oh, the Lord. Oh, God. Thank you for your favor, Lord. Right now, Lord, I receive your favor, Lord. I know I don't deserve it, but I receive it. I receive it. I receive my blessing, Lord. I receive your mercy, Lord. I don't deserve it, but I accept it in the name of Jesus. I accept it right now. Favor, Lord. Favor, Lord. I know you're passing out blessing, Lord. Lord, when you pass out this blessing, please, Lord, let it be me. Favor, Lord. Favor, Lord. Anybody need to favor God in your life? You ready for your blessing? I'm ready for my healing. I'm ready for my deliverance. I'm ready for my joy back. Say the stand my joy. But I'm going to the end of the camp. And I'm going to take back what he stole from me. I'm going to snatch back my joy. I'm going to find that willow tree. Take down my heart. And start that singing for the Lord. I want my joy back. Say the Lord.
with the law. You're here. You think I tell We're waiting on you. We're waiting on you. There's still room. There's still room. There's still room. There's still Hey! 